بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسوله وبعد حياكم الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and today الحمد لله we have uh, our Sheikh Hassan Somali all the way from America uh, and also our brother Shams Adin Abu Aisha may Allah preserve all of them uh, with us on a podcast and we hope inshallah today we will have you know a very fruitful conversation pertaining to like da'wah pertaining to salafia and pertaining to the efforts of the Muslims, generally speaking, in propagating the Sunnah. So, you know, without further ado, we welcome our guest, Sheikh Hassan. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And alhamdulillah, you know, Shamsi as well. Hayak Allah is a good thing. Hayak. Alhamdulillah. So, yeah, to be honest, the people are asking, you know, many, uh, especially those, you know, on social media, especially those on the YouTube, you know, who's Sheikh Hassan? You know, who's Sheikh Hassan when it comes to, you know, Da'awa, is he situated in the UK, or is he situated in America? You know, uh, tell us about your efforts, generally speaking, and, you know, the communities that you're dealing with. No. Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. So, I was born in Cardiff, Wales. Okay. In a place known as Butte Town, which has a rich history because it was one of the first multicultural communities in the UK and the reason for that it was a coal port so a lot of seamen used to come from the Middle East Africa okay. and various parts of the world and they congregated in that area okay so my parents were born there as well oh mashallah okay yes and Somali because of my father his father is from Hargeisa oh so you're mixed race yes mashallah like me then but the lineage from in Islam goes from the father I think in opposition to the Jews, right? I think it's from the mother. No, Jews is the father. It's the father, like uh, this. Uh, yeah. Wallahu a'lam. Wallahu a'lam. Yeah, I think, I think, because, because in the Old Testament it says uh, the, yeah. the seed of the father to be an Israelite. To be part of a certain tribe, it goes by the mother. As well. The mother is what? Well, yeah. Mother is what? Well, yeah. yeah. No. They say it was of the Romans. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. You know, Alhamdulillah. Uh, generally speaking, when it comes to social media, you know, uh, one of the main questions we get. Uh, who are your mashaykh? Who are your scholars or who are your teachers? Shamsi knows. And where have they really studied? So, you know, pertaining to that sort of, you know, subject there, where have you somewhat studied, if that makes any sense? And, you know, how long Alham- for and, you know? Alhamdulillah, studied with primarily Sheikh Mubi, Ta'ala. Rahimullah Ta'ala. You know, during the mid 90s, there was an opportunity to seek knowledge, especially here in the UK, mm. like there is now with regards to the teachers that are here, the mashayikh, and also the number of Salafi masajid and centers. Mm. So there was limited opportunity except for maybe select areas at that time. And also there wasn't the internet lessons like Markaz ibn al-Qayyim and the various maraqis that you have. University of Medina existed, but you know it was you know, very difficult at that time to get accepted. Mm. You know, it was harder than it is now. So a feasible option was Yemen. Okay. Why? Because, you know, it was very cheap, relatively, for somebody to travel to Yemen and, you know, study with Sheikh Mughal, rahimahullah ta'ala. Mm. So I first traveled to Yemen in, I think it was the beginning of 97. Oh, 97. Naam. 1997, and Sheikh Mughal, rahimahullah ta'ala, he was there, and I immediately went to Damaj. You know, that was the place that I wanted to go. Why? Because I heard a lot about it. You mm. know, prior to that, I visited Egypt. And I spent like a month in Egypt. My cousin was there studying. Mm. And some of the Marakis there. However, Egypt wasn't the place for me. For various reasons. So I heard about Yemen. Alhamdulillah. When I heard about Yemen, Sheikh Mubi rahimahullah ta'ala. Obviously, he was from the Mashaykh of the Sunnah. You know, he was praised by the senior scholars of that time, that era. A person of hadith. So Alhamdulillah, it was one of the options available to me. I was studying in London, actually, in King's College, University of London. Okay, before Naam. you went to Yemen. Before I went to Yemen. Is that ah. c- c- central London? Naam. Yeah. Uh, they had a campus, I think, in the Strand, and they had a campus in Kensington. So I was between mm. the two of them. Okay. So Alhamdulillah, I was practicing at that time, you know, ascribing to the Sunnah, Alhamdulillah, mm. Alhamdulillah, but didn't have knowledge of the Arabic language. And at that time, you know, university campuses were a hotbed for debate and discussion. You know, you yeah. had Muhajirun, Hizb tahrir Okay, they were around those they times They were around those times, yeah. Umar Bakri was teaching, actually, in Kings. Okay. Naam. And, you know, you had the people who were calling to 
blind following of the madhahib, you had the Sufiya, mm. you had people, you know, the the takfiris, mm, mm, mm. Azam publications, come and join the caravan of the Azam <laughs> in the hearts of green birds, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so you had all of this taking place, mm. you know, and there was heated discussions about what was correct and what was incorrect. Alhamdulillah, had an understanding, well, alhamd, you know, the mashaykh of the sunnah, mm. Sheikh al-Albani, Sheikh ibn Ubaz, Sheikh ibn Uthaymeen, Sheikh Rabi, Sheikh Muqbir, rahimahumullah ta'ala, and Hafizullah Sheikh Rabi'an, wa al mashaykh al-Akhareen. Naam. Had an understanding, alhamdulillah, that these are the mashaykh and these are those who we return to mm. and benefited from their books and obviously the books of the scholars who preceded them, but had also a desire to learn the Arabic language. So mm. I, after my first year in the university, I left and I went to Yemen. So I was in, alhamdulillah, Damaj from like 97 to 2001 before 9-11. Okay. No. No. Okay. So obviously that was a time where before the time of, uh, as I say, September 11th, what happened, Muslims weren't really somewhat, you know, uh, looked under the you know, eyes of scrutiny, you know, that sort of harsh image, I suppose. Yeah, everything changed after 9-11, subhanAllah, yeah. no doubt. I mean, um, especially for people that studied in Yemen, I think that was a, a region of, you know, scrutiny at that time for, mm. you know, various region, reasons. Um, but alhamdulillah, you know, it was a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, following the Quran and the Sunnah with the understanding of the companions yeah. and at the same time benefiting from the advice of the senior scholars mm -hmm. that was you know again tawfiq is from Allah Azzawajal, success is from Allah alone mm. but they were means to avoid anything that would you know bring about I would say any you know suspicion Okay. from you know various bodies or authorities why because we stayed away from extremism we were against extremism before 9 11. Mm. i think was it uh, muhajirun they were the extremists sometimes yeah muhajirun his but tahrir but they were, mm. they were more mu'tazili you know serious at that time because they used to deny the punishment of the grave yeah okay no oh, okay. Yes. they were more mu'tazili yes they sort of mutated his tahrir you know then they became muhajirun muhajirun they weren't very religiously zahiran apparently they were more into politics even the madahir of the sunnah, you wouldn't see them like with lihya, you wouldn't see them with thiyab. Mm. Even like talking about tawheed, it was all politics. Yeah. When they ah. noticed that people were gravitating to learning that's about right. tawheed and learning about the sunnah, learning about salafiyyah, mm. that's when they started to claim salafiyyah. Yeah, okay. Nah. You know, okay. Hassan, because you mentioned about that we were against extremism even before 9 11. Nah. I know Imam Ibn Hadi al Wadi'i refuted the Laden. Before 9-11? Naam. So... Naam, the first time I heard Usama ibn Laden's name, mm. it was in the match. I was in the class of Sheikh Mubi, rahimahullah. Never heard his name. It must have been like about 2000, wallahu alam, or maybe 99. And um, the Sheikh, he was talking about various subjects and he said in the, the class, he said, Usama ibn Laden, you know, Rajulun Damawi. He's a bloodthirsty individual. Allahu Akbar. I didn't have a clue who he was at that time. So this was prior to 9-11. So... No one can claim that, you know, the position of the Salafis, you know, was dictated by, you know, political events in the Middle East. That's mm. a, a clear line of fabrication. The position of the Mashayikh, the scholars of the Sunnah, and Sheikh Mubil had, you know, he had no connection to the government of Saudi Arabia at that time. Mm. Actually, I don't think he could travel to Saudi Arabia at that period of time. Alhamdulillah, later, mm. when some of the Mashayikh interceded on the Sheikh's behalf and he went to Saudi Arabia for treatment, mm. now, Alhamdulillah, things changed. And he issued a statement, you know, and he took back his speech about the government of Saudi Arabia. That was later on. But Sheikh Mubi rahimahullah ta'ala, you know, in 1999, spoke in condemning bin Laden. Why? Because I think Osama bin Laden at that time, he was going to some of the tribes of Yemen, yeah. trying to, you know, equip them with, you know, military equipment, yeah. guns, and, you know, yeah. other types of military equipment in order to encourage them to rebel against the government. Mm, that manipulation. Nam. Uh, Especially with poverty. You know, the people are poor there. Yeah. So, you know, trying to buy, you know, the people, like, for example, similar to what we see with Iran, you know, at this current time. Uh, yeah, no. that's serious. Because like, even me, I remember seeing a picture of it uh, being in the, I think it was the Sun or one of the old school papers, where it's called him Bin Laden, whatever his name is, the freedom fighter against the Soviet Union. I don't know if that picture is still available to him now. Yeah, I mean, Sheikh even Sheikh Mbaz won't guess him before the... 11. No. Even Shmambaz won't, I guess. And if, if you look at his teachers, the majority of them are, yeah. you know, the figureheads of Al-Ikhwan. He has no connection with, you know, Salafiyya or any of the Mashaykh of Salafiyya. Wow. But Alhamdulillah, like the, the position of Ahl Sunnah, you know, they've been consistent, you know, condemning extremism and terrorism way before 9 11. 
Why? Because it clearly opposes the text of the Quran and the Sunnah. That's right. You know, Hassan, you mentioned that I had one of the things that Imam Muqib ibn Hadir Wadi was known for is always to advise the students, make sure your da'wah is tamiz. No. I mean, you don't mix with the people. Because some people now uh, claim to attribute themselves to, to da'wah of Imam Muqib ibn Hadir Wadi, yeah. but you see them mixing with everyone. No. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, the Sheikh would say, uh, you know, frequently, he would say that after the blessing of Allah, Azzawajal, one of the main reasons for the spread of the da'wah of the people of the Sunnah in Yemen is their tamayyus, their clarity in their call. That, you know, they're free from innovation and the people of innovation. And that was known, subhanAllah. I've never seen anything like it, to be honest with you. Mm. In Yemen at the time, it was clear the people of the Sunnah were the people of the Sunnah, right. and the people of Bid'ah were the people of Bid'ah. You know, there was no middle ground. Not like today, you know, when yeah. you have some people who claim to be upon the Sunnah, but like you said, they're taking the people of innovation and misguidance as friends, or they want a, you know, a selfie moment, yeah. or they want to yeah. be accepted by everyone. That clearly wasn't the da'wah of Sheikh Mubi, rahimahullah ta'ala. Oh, you oh, know, the Sheikh, rahimahullah, he didn't used to fear the blame of the blamers. And it was all out of advice because, you know, he loved it and he wanted good for the Muslims. You know, that was the premise. You know, the same as the Allah said about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, if you, out of the mercy of Allah, you were gentle with them. The Sheikh, no, no doubt, when there was the time to be stern, he was stern. But the majority of the time, he was gentle, especially with the common Muslims. And the people loved him for that. Allah Akbar. The layman Muslims. Yeah, Allah the general Allah. Muslims now. Yeah. Commoners, that's Allah. deep. You know, and that's how you see the, you know, the beauty of the Dawah Ahl Sunnah. You know, they understand people's predicaments and circumstances and they don't chase people away. And even if people have shortcomings, yes, they can't condone those shortcomings, but they will give them advice in the best fashion. And even the common people come to love him. Even the people of the Maj, who are just general people, they yeah. would just tell us stories for days. Like we ride with them maybe to the store or, you know, yeah. talk with them just maybe in the, the cafeteria. They had a, a mat'am, there was one mat'am there. And they would tell you stories about Sheikh Mubi Rahimahullah and various incidents and how he spoke the truth and, mm. you know, and he was courageous. And, you know, even though the people of Sa'ada, you know, tried to ridicule him, but he wasn't wavered by that, you know, and you could just listen to their stories. And they had, you know, a lot of respect for the Sheikh Rahimahullah Ta'ala. That's deep, subhanAllah. And they were awam and, you know, at the beginning, they were Zaydis. They weren't people of Sunnah. Okay, so those people... They were Zaydis. They were originally... Zaydia, a sect of the Shia. A sect of a Shia. Now, not the Zaydia, as far as the yeah. Rafidah, you know, still upon innovation, but not yeah. as extreme as the Rafidah Shia. Okay, okay. Um, so when they've noticed the Sheikh was clearly calling to Eid and the Sunnah, no altering down, alhamdulillah, they, they, they accepted the Dawah. Yeah, they accepted it. No, they like, loved him. Yeah, now, subhanAllah, what we no. see, people just mixing everything and, they, and they're causing more confusion then. Clarity. Yeah. Yeah. And even when the Sheikh used to travel, Rahimullah, like if he used to go to Sana'a, mm. if you saw how many people attended his lectures, subhanAllah, it was like a football match. Serious? Yeah, they used to have, you know, guards on the, the roof. It was so many people, subhanAllah. The masjid, you know, you've never seen crowds like that. That was the level of acceptance, alhamdulillah, that Allah has placed on the earth for the Sheikh and his da'wah. Mm. To the extent that his da'wah spread all over Yemen, you know, in such a short period of time. Just think of it, you know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in control of everything. Yeah. He was in a region of Yemen, you know, Damaj, which is inside of Sa'ada, that if it wasn't for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreeing that the Sheikh was there, I doubt anyone, any of us would have went there. There's nothing there. SubhanAllah. You know, I was from Sana'a, the capital, yeah. Yeah. and it's, you know, it's a, it's a difficult journey. It's in the mountains. It's quite yeah. dangerous. There's nothing there. there was, there's no reason for <laughs> anyone to go there. Yeah. But alhamdulillah, a scholar of the Sunnah, and people come from all over the world. Oh, yes, yeah, subhanAllah. No. That's deep. And that's why, you know, people saying, oh, people are trying to control the da'wah. To me, anyone who says that you have a weakness in your tawakkul, who Allah can prevent, Allah. you know, Allah Azza wa Jal subhanahu wa ta'ala once he decrees something? Yeah. No. What countries were they from, the other students? Was it all over the world, literally? Yeah, you had students from, you know, Libya at that time, you know, they were, they were running away from the, the tribulations of Gaddafi mm. and um, Algeria. You had students from, obviously, many students from inside of Yemen itself, Egypt, Jordan, all over. You know, even from the West, France, Sweden, the UK, America, from all over the world. Oh. No. Mm. When I first went there, like I said, in 97, you know, the Western students, they weren't that many. Yeah. Maybe about 10, Allah, and give or take. 10 Western students? Yeah, 10 Western students. From the West or from? France, Sweden. Um, America, okay. and there may have been a few other countries. Okay. No. Okay, that's deep. Because one thing I wanted to ask, especially uh, when we were speaking to Abdullah Yemeni, 
what was the most significant thing you saw? Something that just hasn't left you. Obviously, it probably have been, you know, numerous things, but what's the most significant thing that you saw when you went Yemen, Dar al Hadith, that <clears throat> stuck there? I think the implementation of the Sunnah. Yeah. Because certain practices of the Sunnah, I witnessed there, you know, I've, I've never seen them implemented in other places, you know, in the earth. Okay. Nam. Like for what? Like, for example, I mean, even praying in your shoes in okay. the masjid. I've yeah. never seen that anywhere else except there. Now, it's obviously, we know if there's a carpet, we take off our shoes. Yeah. But praying, for example, in your shoes in the masjid, Allah. that was something that they practice in Damaj. Even outside of Damaj, in the other masjid of the sunnah, mm. that wasn't observed. And alhamdulillah, now, like the ulama, they mentioned, you know, we're not going to waste money and, you know, dirty the carpet. The carpet so, yeah. alhamdulillah, we take off our shoes, which is clear. Wallah, wal minna. But the sheikh opted to, you know, implement that sunnah. That, you know, obviously you verify and make sure that your shoes are clean of any impurity. But then you will go in the masjid and you could pray in your shoes. Mm -hmm. And it was just a simple, you know, simple covering, simple carpet. Uh, now, simplicity. Yeah. <laughs> People of sunnah, mashallah. Now, another thing that I noticed there, you know, the love that the sheikh had, you know, for knowledge. Rahimahullah ta'ala. Even on the day of Eid, he would cancel the lesson after Dhuhr and I think after Asr. So he's doing minimum four to five books a day. Three times a day. They were the mandatory lessons. Is that something everyone has to go to or is that optional? Yeah, everyone had to go to it, attend those lessons. But then outside of that, you had your own, you know, individual lessons. Halaqat al Yeah, Halaqat al So for example, you went there learning Arabic, you would do the three Medina books. Obviously, that's what you would start. Oh, you do the Medina books? Medina books. And then once you finish the Medina books, you join Ajrumi. You know, after you do Ajrumi, you do Mutamima, Kawakib was the explanation that they would do there. Okay. Then after that, you do, you know, Qatar al Nada. That was the, you know, the Arabic program. Mm -hmm. one, the first book, uh, one of the first books that you would do in Aqidah would be uh, Al Qawl al Mufi fi Adilat al Tawheed. Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahab al Wasabi, Rahimullah Ta'ala. Okay. Yeah. okay, that's deep. Because a lot of yeah. people always ask me, from my experience, which is, you know, very small in comparison to what anyone else has probably seen, but how long does it really kind of take a man? Those times there, from, you know, Dar was it Dar Hadith? Dar Hadith, yeah. To learn Arabic. I mean, it depends on the individual, isn't it? Yeah, this is what no, I say. It depends sometimes. on the individual. Yeah. I mean, but you but would what have were brothers. You seeing? What was your perspective? You were seeing people, for example, come with nothing and then all of a sudden start conversing in Arabic. What sort of time span you're talking about? Uh, alhamdulillah, you had some brothers, mashallah, there. They would benefit six months, you know, mashallah. And oh, you oh, would, oh. they would finish the med three Medina books. Six months? Yeah, in six months. Oh, oh. You know, others a year, depending on the student. And you had, mashallah, some brothers who were very, you know, eloquent in, in the Arabic language. Mm -hmm. Some of the Western brothers, mashallah, and they spoke in Arabic. You know, some of them, you wouldn't differentiate between them and an Arab, mashallah. And a lot of their Arabic came from mukhalata, you know, mixing with the students and speaking ah, Arabic. Okay. More so than the study maybe of grammar. Okay. Now, so it depends on the individual. But mm. one thing about Damaj, you know, it was a place that Allah Azawajal blessed, you know, and even the Sheikh, Sheikh Mughbir, rahimahullah, mentioned that you may have a student that, you know, attended Dar al-Hadith, Mm. studied there you know he may stay there for a year or two and he may benefit more than somebody that studied in maybe somewhere else for you know a number of years mm. it's about how, how Allah Azza blesses you know a person's time one of the things I think that was unique about the Maj was that you know it, it was just a place of knowledge imagine mm. just a small there's no know, dunya yeah no dunya <laughs> nothing that's the thing that kind of gets there's me. nothing there's yeah. nothing you know? there and it's just you know pure sunnah there's nothing uh, you know mm. you had one you had maybe like you had one store you know, in the single quarters, and there was one like restaurant, small restaurant, like very simple, mm. and that would be the single quarters. And in the married quarters, you have one like you know one just basic shop, one store. And apart from that, you got the masjid in the married quarters, and you had the main masjid where the sheikh taught in the single quarters, and that was it. You know, literally. But just to make wow. it clear to the viewers, we're talking about back then. Yeah, back now, then. No, no, yeah, the so, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't, I don't know what's going on there now. Yeah, Allah now is the, Allah knows best. The Rafida. You no. know, one thing I was going to ask you, Sheikh. You know, when uh, Imam Muqbil bin Hadi al-Wadi'i, like when he's, when he knows someone's going back to the Western world, or to the Gharb, what is the advice he gives to the Tullah that they're like going back to the West? Yeah. One of the main pieces of advice that he would give is, you know, for the strong students to benefit, you know, the, their brothers and their sisters. We had a link with Sheikh Muqbil. I was still in Damaj at the time. Mm. And um, the Sheikh, Rahimullah Ta'ala, Sheikh Muqbil, he gave a lecture to the brothers and the sisters in America. Mm. Even I advise people to listen to that up until today because you see the insight of the Sheikh. Seriously. You know, he was advising the people of America and he was warning them against people that try and split them on, you know, racial lines. 
And no, you no, see no, that no. taking place now even in the Muslim Subhanahu community. Allah, that goes on. Nah, he, he was advising them back then. Subhanallah. Back then. And you see, like I said, you see the basir of the ulama yeah. because they're aware that these things happen. You know, and he was, you know, stressing that the Muslim is the brother of the Muslim, regardless of their color, whether they're Arab, whether they're non-Arab. But in the talk he mentioned, he said, he advised, he said, I advised the, you know, the brothers and the sisters in America yeah. to benefit from uh, Abul Hassan Malik. He said, for verily, he's a strong student of knowledge. Allah, what year was that, Sheikh? That was like 2000. 2000. 2000. No. No. <laughs> 23 years ago. No. Wow. And he said then... Ago. He said, I advise the, the, the brothers and sisters in America to benefit from Abul Hassan. Because the Sheikh was, you know, Alhamdulillah. The, one thing about the scholars, especially the senior scholars, they just want to see people benefit. Uh. You know, all this, you know, the picture that some of the Hizbis, they paint about them and the people of innovation, that people, they're trying to control this and control that. It can be further from the truth. Mm -hmm. What we learned from our senior scholars, the most important thing for them was that the Dao was spreading. And Alhamdulillah, there was cooperation upon righteousness and piety. And the Dao was given in the correct fashion. That's that right. the fundamentals of the people of the Sunnah were not being compromised. That was the mm -hmm. most important thing. And they would advise, when you go back to your country, benefit the people from what, what Allah Azza wa Subhanahu wa Ta'ala has taught you. And stay within that capacity and alhamdulillah, mm. you will benefit the people. And we see it. Students of Shaykh Mukbil, rahimullah ta'ala, up until today, all over the dunya benefiting the people. Allah. You know, alhamdulillah. And that's from the fruits of the da'wah of the Shaykh Rahmatullah Ali. Yeah. You know, uh, to be honest, the whole Daru Hadith sort of conversation could be a whole hour and a half, yeah. to be honest. Without <laughs> but you, should, you should know people as well. We have two brothers here who are hiding. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to hear them speaking, so don't be confused. Yeah, we have our brother Anwar and brother Uthman. No. So sometimes they, they have to they will intervene or mm -hmm. ask questions or comment. No. So transitioning from Daru Hadith, Yemen. Uh, as I say, back to reality now, back to the West, yeah. you know, back to the trenches, maybe. Uh, that, and I think that's one of the main challenges for somebody that studied in Damaj and then you come back to the real world. Yeah. How do you practically apply that knowledge to the real world that you're coming that's back to? Points. And I think that's where some people struggled mm. because, you know, certain things, alhamdulillah, no doubt, you know, you, you can't compromise concerning, but there, there are certain things where there are, you know, there's room Mm. for a difference of opinion between the ulama. Mm. I'll give an example, yeah, right? Absolutely. For example, in, when you were in Yemen as a student of knowledge of Sheikh Mubi rahimahullah ta'ala, again, the people of the Sunnah would always wear thiyab, right? And okay. it was a sign of the people of Hizbi and Dalala, like you would see them in, you know, pants or trousers, where, <laughs> you know, wherever you want to call them, right? Yeah. You know, however, coming back to the West, a person, you know, may ha have to work, right? That's right. So transition into that. And we know Sheikh Ibn Uthaymi rahimahullah said that that's not resembling the non-Muslims. Why? Because now that's something that's shared between the Muslims and the non-Muslims. As long as it meets the requirements, it covers the aura yeah. above the ankles and so on and so forth. I mean, that's just one example. Mm. But there are other, other examples as well. And yeah. I think that, that, that was a major challenge for some of the people coming back, you know, to the West. Yeah. How do I apply that knowledge that I learned, you know, to the world that I'm going to live in today? So and especially in Western lands. Yeah, you know, Sheikh, you mentioned in that surah, yeah, go for it, it's very important because what happened, some young brothers that went after Sheikh Mubil died to the match, especially in 2008 and nine. I remember when they came back from the match, they start misimplementing the teaching. And they, every time they see a brother with a trousers, mm. they say he's not serious. But actually, this brother has to go to work. No. You cannot apply the, the lifestyle of the match to yeah. Britain. You have to be wise how to implement it. No. That's so barakallah for mentioning this point. Even the issue, subhanAllah, like another issue that, you know, arose, and you must probably heard about it, the issue of like sadaqa boxes. Mm. Yes. You know, you had some of the students, they would yeah. come back and they would be like, it's a bid'ah. These people, they're not Salafis because they have sadaqa boxes in the masjid. Uh, the sheikh, you know, obviously speaking about what was, you know, known maybe in Yemen at that particular moment in time. Yeah. But there were also other aqwal of senior scholars like Sheikh Al-Fawzan, Sheikh Zaid and others that allowed it. Mm. And I think um, there, was, there, there was some masajid that they wouldn't, you know, encourage people to donate to pay the bills of the masjid and, you know, the expenses of the masjid. And I think some of those mas masajid actually closed down. Yeah, yeah. Look at that. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah, Which again, down. subhanAllah, you know what's amazing? I have a letter, you know, from the sheikh. It was, you know, at that time, Sheikh Muqa rahimahullah ta'ala, sometimes, no, no doubt, he would write, you know, certain recommendations himself. Sometimes he would get, I think it was... Um, Ahmed al-Wasabi to write it, but he, you would go to him and he would stamp it. The Sheikh rahimahullah ta'ala, we were thinking even back then to open up a, a center in Somaliland or Somalia, mm. right? 
And um, I went to get a recommendation from Sheikh Mukbir, rahimahullah. So he had, you know, his student, Ahmed al-Wasabi, mm-hmm. he had it, him write it. And when we went to the Sheikh, he stamped it. But in there, it was an encouragement that, you know, our brother Hassan is one of our students. And we encouraged the people to assist him in establishing a center in Somalia. So look, the Sheikh wasn't against encouraging people to donate. He was against people begging in the name of the da'wah. Uh. You know, like some of the people of partisanship they were doing. Yeah. The way they would stand up and they would ask for money and all of a sudden, you know, they're collecting money for themselves. Because if you look at the text of the book in the Sunnah, Naman, he has dhamm al-mas'ala, you know, the condemnation of begging. Yeah. Which, no doubt. And some people, they do go to extremes in that area. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But when you're encouraging others to donate to, you know, build a masjid or to establish a school, you know, it doesn't fall under that. No. Yeah. So that's another example. Because the maslaha is amma. No. Yeah, this no. is yeah. great benefit. And if, for example, you take that position, of, for example, if you take that position, طيب, but don't compel others. Al-wala wal bara. And now you make, you're taking people outside the fold of the sunnah because they take the call of Sheikh Al-Fawzan in that masala. Yeah, when it's clear, clearly a masala that's ijtihadiyah. Yes. No. Yeah, this is an issue which, uh, not no. just particular, in yeah. particular this issue, but other issues along those lines are somewhat you know, uh, made its way into the, you know. uh, And that's why, you know, as well, one of the, you know, like the Salaf, they used to say, whoever wants to know the error of their teacher, you know, is for them to study with other scholars and other teachers. Mm. And it's always, uh, you know, it's it's a blessing. Naam, you you have the opportunity to learn from as many mashayikh as you can, you know, studying in Yemen. But then, alhamdulillah, you know, I would have loved to have gone to Medina. It just, you know, Allah Azza wa Jalla didn't decree it for me. You know, various things in life, alhamdulillah. But, you know, I'm happy that I had the opportunity to be in the Maj. But I spent some time in Medina with Sheikh Ubaid. You know, Habibullah Ta'ala. I was there for like, I was living with the brother, Sheikh Ubaid. Rahimahullah Ta'ala. Rahimahullah Ta'ala. Naam, Sheikh Ubaid. Look, subhanAllah, it's like, we just lost one of the, recently, one of the ulama. We was in contact with him on a regular basis. Rahimahullah Ta'ala. Now, with regards to, you know, that time, I stayed with Sheikh Anwar when, when we were in Medina. Okay. And just even, like I said, sitting with Sheikh Ubaid, and alhamdulillah, he, you know, the Sheikh, again, this is to, you know, to debunk the accusation that the scholars don't care about us. Going from the UK, Medina, yeah. you know, alhamdulillah, I had a relationship with the Sheikh, but the Sheikh would give us, you know, private time, go to his house, you know, daily to okay. sit with him. Mm. Just me and the Sheikh, rahimahullah ta'ala. But again, just seeing different, you know, opinions from the Sheikh, you see, alhamdulillah, some matters you get an understanding, some matters nam are uh, clear. There's no khilaf. Matters of aqidah, like Sheikh Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, said, and ibn al-Qayyim, it's not known from the companions that they differed about any of the fundamentals of the religion. But there are certain things, you know, matters of ijtihad, that Sheikh Muqbil, Sheikh, you know, the mashayikh of the mamlaka, even as it relates maybe even to Sheikh al-Albani, that the mashayikh, they're going to disagree upon. Hmm. But they never, you know, expel one another from the realms of the sunnah. Right. Like, for example, where do you put your hands, you know, uh, when you come from Ruku'ah? Okay. For example, Sheikh al-Albani held it was a bid'ah, yeah, yeah. you know, to put it back upon your chest. Mm. Yeah. Others, you know, the other scholars said, la, there's no clear proof in it, Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah, whether you put it on your chest, whether you leave it on your side, you know, la mm. So you, you understand how to maneuver with those type of issues. And like I said, one of the challenges was, you know, for some of the students coming from Damaj, how do we take this knowledge that we learned? Alhamdulillah. And this tamasuk, which was praiseworthy, mm. this adherence to the sunnah, and how do we apply it now coming back, you know, to, for example, where they, wherever you go, western lands or even some of the Muslim lands? Yeah. Because it's, it's a different predicament. Yeah, because obviously Yemen is yeah. like quite old school. You know what I mean? The people there, they're very traditionally intact with their culture, I suppose. But if you go other places, Even the madhab. Yeah, yeah, but even in Damaj, you're only going to be around the sheikh and his students. Yeah, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. The whole... Uh, yeah, okay, so outside of the Maj, you're going to have limited contact with the the, mm. the people in the uh, the Maj, They're going to either majority of them. They're going to pray, mm. you know, either in the main masjid, yeah, which was the masjid where of the sheikh where the lessons, you know, were established, mm. or they're going to pray in the mazra. They had like a few, you know, small musallas that they used to pray in, but still, alhamdulillah, it's going to be under the influence of the sheikh. That's so even you, you know, mixing with the common people is going to be limited. You're mixing with, with mm. primarily students of knowledge. Yeah, subhanallah. Yeah, people of knowledge. Yeah. No. Allah al-ilm. Sheikh Hassan, just going back to that um, transitioning back into life, no. and settling back into, you know, uh, the country you travelled from. Um, some people like complain sometimes about difficulties about um, settling back in and finding work and things like this because there's a lot of messages right now especially directed towards the youth where, you know, if you work for someone, 
you you know you're a you, you know you, it's not honorable uh you're you know, a slave. you got you got yeah you got to have millions yeah. in the bank you got and it confuses the youth no you see and then they find it hard to transition they find it hard to balance and then things kind of go wrong from there so no. w- w- you got any advice about that i would advise like Allah is just says in the Quran, وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهِ يَجَعَلُ مَخْرَجَ وَيَرُزُقُهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبُ وَمَن يَتَوَكَّلَ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَوَحَسْبُهُ You know, whoever fears Allah, جل, Allah will provide for them a way out. And, you know, He will sustain them from avenues that they could not imagine. Whoever places their trust in Allah, Allah جل, is sufficient for them. You know, just be patient. I mentioned in the talk today, Imam Sa'di, rahimahullah, you know, in his treaties, um, الدين الصحيح يحل جميع المشاكل the correct religion, it solves all problems. And he mentions the, you know, the problem, المشكلة uh, الثالث, I think it was the third problem, مشكلة الغنى والفقر, the dilemma of poverty and wealth. Mm. And like I explained, you know, this evening in East London, that a person, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may trial them with poverty. However, alhamdulillah, a person has to be pleased with the decree of Allah azawajal. But at the same time, there are legislated means to try and, you know, better oneself, you know, and improve one's condition. Obviously, we praise our trust in Allah Azza wa Jal, but the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Ihris ala ma yanfa'uka wa billah wa la ta'jaz. You know, focus upon what is beneficial for you and seek the aid of Allah and do not be lazy. Focus upon what's beneficial, obviously, as it relates to religious knowledge, but even worldly things that are going to better your, you know, circumstances, whether it's education or whether, you know, or whether it's a trade. And alhamdulillah, be patient. You know, the most important thing is that, you know, you try and fear Allah and adhere, you know, to the teachings of the religion. And Allah, جل, you know, he will provide a way out. We were all in that predicament. But I, me and uh, Sheikh Anwar and some of the other brothers, we talk about it, you know, on a regular basis. You know, there were times, subhanAllah, that, you know, you would have nothing. Huh? You know, like you said, you, you come back, you're transitioning, you don't have a job or, you know, you're trying to weigh up your options. Am I going to go back to education? What's the best option for me? Just, you know, fear Allah Azza wa Jal subhanahu wa ta'ala and be patient. Allah Azza wa Jal will provide, you know, a way out. I remember Sheikh Anwe, he graduated from Medina. He came back and there was a time, you know, he was working in Ikea. So, um, right. Sheikh Anwe, right. Yeah. Yeah. But Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, made it for him a way out. You know, alhamdulillah, he has a good job now. He's a chaplain, you know, in the prison system in the U.S. Alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. And he's educating, you know, the inmates. Yeah. You know, alhamdulillah, with wisdom and, you know, correct teachings. MashaAllah. Yeah. Naam. MashaAllah. And, you know, alhamdulillah, using, you know, he went to Medina, he graduated from the College of Hadith, and he's educating people now, alhamdulillah, correctly, you know, and benefiting people. So just those examples and seeing Allah, as we just, subhanahu wa ta'ala, made a way out for, you know, him and other brothers like him. Alhamdulillah, you know, akhi, no doubt, alhamdulillah, I see that that promise there. Whoever fears Allah, جل, Allah will give them a way out. 100%. But it, it requires patience. It might not be immediate. Mm. And we're going to be tested, all of us. None of us are perfect. We're not angels. But just, alhamdulillah, keep striving. You know, do that which is lawful, alhamdulillah. And, you know, the, uh, the, the makhraj will come, bi ta'ala. Yeah. 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 You know, I think we have to move to the German town. <laughs> yeah, I, w- I was going to get to that. I was just waiting. I thought, Sheikh Anwar, yes, oh, that's man, we're going to come with something. Understand. So when you came back from Yemen, where did you go to? Was you back in I was Cardiff? in Cardiff, yeah. When okay. I came back from Yemen, I was in Cardiff. And alhamdulillah, I just came back. I, I always wanted to go back to Yemen mm. when I came back. But 9-11, they wouldn't let me yeah, back in. Yeah, yeah. You know, my, my wife was there at the time. Mm. And my son. Mm-hmm. Uh, my two sons were there. Serious. Yeah, my wife, subhanAllah. And because Yemen, oh, I mean, the, in the Majd, they, they were in Sana'a at that ah, time. Salah, okay. But um, because uh, my two older sons, they were born in Yemen. Actually, mm-hmm. one of them was born in Sa'ada, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. in the hospital in Sa'ada, and one of them was born in um, Sana'a. So I planned to go back. Mm-hmm. But after 9 11, I applied for a visa. They refused my visa. Mm-hmm. I tried every way possible, you know, to get back, but it was impossible. Qaddar Allah ma shafa'an. You know, as we say, MashaAllah kan wa ma lam yasha lam yakun. Whatever Allah wills, it will happen. If Allah doesn't will it, it will never happen. Mm. So by default, I was here. Even though my intention was to try and go back. Go back. So Alhamdulillah, I was here, you know, again, didn't know, similar thing, transitioning. What do I, what's going to be, you know, the future? And I remember I attended a conference in Birmingham and um, Sheikh Abu Khadija, Hafidullah Ta'ala, Sheikh Abdul Salam Burgis was giving a lecture and he's gone, you know, 
you have to translate for Sheikh Abdul Salam Burjis. And I'm like, I've never translated <laughs> live in my life. <laughs> Inshallah, that tape's lost because it's probably the worst translation ever. You know, <laughs> well, probably the worst live translation. <laughs> Akhi, the voice was unclear and it was the first ever time, you know, translating. Mm. And then yeah. Alhamdulillah, you know, like I said, just being back, you know, just Alhamdulillah uh, in Cardiff at that time, you know, just trying to benefit, you know, some of the brothers and the sisters. Mm. We were at Masjid Nur to begin with, alhamdulillah. Mm. Um, we opened uh, the bookstore, the Salafi bookstore, and we had a small center. That's where we would teach, alhamdulillah. You know, sort of, we were finding after, you know, various fitan, especially the fitan of Abul Hassan, you know, we were prevented from teaching in various places. We were taught it's either our way or the highway. Mm -hmm. So we were like, alhamdulillah, the earth of Allah is spacious. Walillah mm. minna. You know, we're not going to compromise about what we, you know, believe to be the truth. And we opened the Salafi bookstore and we had a space in the back to teach. So Alhamdulillah, we started off, you know, a few lessons there. And Alhamdulillah, the, you know, after, you know, later on, the brothers, Allah blessed them to open Masjid al tawheed al Tawheed. Mm. You know, which is, mashallah, beacon of light, mashallah, Juhud Mubarak. Where, where, is it, where is it located? It's in Grangetown. It's in Grangetown. Mashallah, a beautiful location. Yeah, I've been there, mashallah. The yeah, the beautiful yeah, location. Mashallah. Diverse community, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah people alhamdulillah. benefiting, well, alhamd, you know. Yeah. Good uh, group of brothers, sisters, well, alhamd, focusing on the da'wah. They have the da'wah table, you know, the yeah, same as yeah, the brothers here in London. Yeah, yeah. That's I one of the, the blessings mashallah. of the da'wah, the people of the sunnah. Tamiz. Like, yeah, yeah, tamiz. Yeah, all of this, alhamdulillah, through clarity in the da'wah. And, you know, people... I think sometimes we underestimate uh, this stuff is historic mm. that you have now so many masajid of sunnah, mm. you know, in nearly every major city in the UK. Oh yeah. You know, when I first started practicing, there were okay, virtually, you know, there were very few closer to zero mm. rather than now. Alhamdulillah, you go to nearly every major city. You can't visit. Every time I come to the UK, there's so many invites. You can't go to every center <laughs> or every masjid. Yeah. But again, Alhamdulillah, it shows the blessings of Allah Azza upon Ahlul Sunnah. And, you know, after the blessings of Allah, the efforts, alhamdulillah, of the brothers. Mm -hmm. Well, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. here. Mm -hmm. And this is historical, alhamdulillah. And people try and paint them with a brush that, you know, they're chaotic and they're this and they're that. Okay, chaotic people couldn't establish what has been established here. In yeah, terms of the masajid, true. in terms of the schools, in terms of the dawah tables, in terms of the, you know, the charitable efforts, in terms of classes, you know, yeah, you the know, classes and stuff yeah. like that, alhamdulillah, that we, uh, we're all benefiting from. Mm. Alhamdulillah. I used to benefit from Sheikh Amjad, you know, from when it was, before it was uh, self-publications, it was Essex University homepage. Uh, you know, I used, call, about yesterday. Yeah. I used to call him, he was in Essex at that time, and I used to call him, you know, with certain questions and ask him, that, like, that was mid-90s. Mid mm. Wow. He was active, translating oh. the works of the scholars, connecting people to the scholars. So, okay, a person may disagree with the, you know, the, those mashayikh in a particular matter, but you, what, you ignore and you throw away all of their good? You know, you turn a blind eye to all of the khayr and you just, you know, you just want to focus upon, you know, one issue that you claim you know, that deserves all of this, you know, back and forth and all of this speech. And, and that issue is not even a found fundamental issue. Exactly. It's not usul. Because you know, it's not an yeah. issue of fundamentals. And yeah. alhamdulillah, if you look, the brothers, walillah alhamd, their da'wah today, walillah alhamd, is the same as their da'wah previously. Yes. You know, calling to tawheed, calling to sunnah, sunnah. calling to ta'ah, warning against shirk, warning against bid'ah, yeah. warning against ma'asiyah. It's exactly the same. Whereas others who started off like them, like Maghrib, like Kawthar, and the other organizations, okay, you see today, they're, you know, they're, they're more liberal than they are orthodox, mm. even though they claim to be orthodox. Yeah. Like you have uh, Muslim Matters. They claim to be an orthodox voice of Muslims in the West. How are you an orthodox voice of Muslims in the West where you had Jonathan Brown on you know, a podcast defending you know, the, the, you know, the right to depict the Prophet and claiming that it's a matter of differing amongst the Muslims because, and the proof was, not any text of the Qur'an, not any text of the Sunnah, not any quotes from any scholars, but that you had Muslim artists who previously drew pictures of the Prophet wasallam or what they believed to be the Prophet wasallam. I mean, you had Muslims that drank alcohol. Does that mean it's a matter of khilaf? <laughs> and that rulers, you know, some rulers requested that. Yes, you had righteous rulers and you had rulers that, you know, would oppose what we find in the Qur'an and the Sunnah. But subhanAllah, even Ammi, Sunni, would know that disrespecting prophets or drawing the prophets is haram. It's a no-go. Yeah, I mean. yeah, it's an area that you don't even, you don't you know, even, come you don't even approach. Yes. Yes. And you know what's amazing, subhanAllah, there was a, a university, I think it was in New York, if I'm not mistaken, I think they sacked uh, a lecturer because 
the Muslim students had mentioned, she warned them pre prior to the class that, you know, we're going to show pictures of the Prophet or, you know, supposed pictures of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I think some of the students, they complained mm -hmm. and they said it's disrespectful to us. She went ahead and done it and I think they fired her. So these, you know, uh, Jonathan mm -hmm. Brown and, you know, Muslim Matters, they were defending that position about showing Allah. these type of pictures in that yeah. setting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Billah. And the thing about it is, subhanAllah, mm. even if you look at, you know, these, you know, claim pictures of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you can see that they fall into exactly the same thing that the Christians fell into when they depicted Jesus Alayhi Salatu Alayhi Salam. Salam, yeah. That's one of the reasons that it's prohibited. One, ghulu, the exaggeration, because it mm. leads to shirk. Yeah. And secondly, you have people painting Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with Mongolian features. Yeah, you know, based upon their race yeah. okay. and their the, ethnicity. The, 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 yeah, no, no, no. Prophet Muhammad first, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Oh, okay, okay. So you have Mongolians, you know, painting like, what they okay. claim was the picture of the yeah. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but with Mongolian features. Mm. Mm. Because, and that's why the Europeans, when they wanted to depict Jesus, well, yeah. they drew a picture of blonde hair, blue eyes. White Jesus. Yeah, yeah and the yeah. paler, you know, pale skin. Mm -hmm. And the Caribbean with a rasta. <laughs> yes, yeah. So you even see he opens the door to nationalism, not yeah. just shirk, nationalism on all types of it's corruption like and chaos. Yeah. Just, uh, mm -hmm. So yeah. how, you know, you see, alhamdulillah, the brothers, well, alhamdulillah, like you said, as it relates to the fundamentals, they, well, alhamdulillah, they have been firm upon the orthodox positions, upon the usul of Ahl sunnah These other individuals, they started off claiming to be orthodox, but look how far they are from orthodoxy today. Yes, yeah, that's just the reality. No. Yeah, subhanallah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Alhamdulillah. So after Cardiff, so how long were you in Cardiff until you went to Philly and how did that come about? I can't remember, subhanAllah, what year we went to Philadelphia. What happened was, um, so Alhamdulillah, I was t in Cardiff and I used to teach in London like, every week. We used to come. Uh, every Friday Allah. I used to teach in Durning Hall. In, in, Asariya, East, they, London. in East London. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They didn't have, uh, at that time, they didn't have Masjid Ibn Ibad. That's Ibn Ibn true. Mm -hmm. it was alhamdulillah, that came later. Huh? Is it for sale? It was Denning Hall. Like There's Stratford somewhere, no? Stratford or Forest Hill or something? Forest, Forest Gate. Gate. Forest uh, for, sorry, yeah. Forest Gate. Gate. Forest Hill was south east next to Lucian. So every Forest week, Gate, yeah. you know, we would come, alhamdulillah, yeah. and we would teach, mashallah, in, in Durning Hall. Mm. So I, I can't remember the year exactly. Wallahu alam. We went to Canada. It might have been like around 2005. No, it was earlier than that. SubhanAllah. It might have been like 2001. Mm. After 9-11, we went to Canada. And we met some of the brothers from Philadelphia. And they were like, you have to come to Philadelphia. It was me and Sheikh Abu Hakim. Mm. And I'm like, I didn't prepare to go to America right now. You know, <laughs> I just came to Canada, maybe later on. So Alhamdulillah, we went back, me and Sheikh Abu Hakim, we went back to the UK. And I think it was 2002, we visited Philadelphia for da'wah. And um, I visited Philadelphia in the mid 90s. Mm. I have family in America. Mm. My auntie, she lived in Maryland. Mm. I have auntie, uh, my other auntie lived in... Uh, you know, Alabama. So historically, I visited there from the 80s, mm -hmm. you know, with my, with my parents. We went to Philadelphia, you know, mid 90s, but it, I, I wasn't practicing then. And it wasn't like Maryland, you know, it was laid back, you know, it, it seemed to be a lot more affluent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I gravitated more to Maryland than I did to Philadelphia. Going back to Philadelphia for Da'wah, when I was there, I got married and that's how I got connected to Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, mm -hmm. so like 2002. So that's where my connection with Philadelphia started. Oh, no. How did that pick up? Like, how did the, how did it grow? Roughly, what was it like there? What was the status? Like, how, kind of how? What was the scene there? Alhamdulillah, the dawah was always there. Mashallah, Sheikh Abu Wais Rahimullah Taala. You know his efforts, Sheikh Abu Hassan Malik. You know, and others. Wallahul Minna. You know, active in educating the people. And there was, you know, a few masajid at that time. You know, Masjid Sunnah Al Nabawiya, and there was. A few other masajid in that locality, Wallahalham wal Minna, Alhamdulillah. It's not; it wasn't as big as it is now, but it was there, Alhamdulillah. But historically, Philadelphia has like always been like the the main place for Muslims, no? Or one, of like, main one of the main places. Yeah, because <coughs> why is that? Historically? Because uh, the nation. There was a strong oh, presence okay. of the nation of yeah, Islam, uh, and after the nation of Islam, Islam, a lot of them left the nation and they. Join, they become Sunni Muslims, mm, mm, mm. but they uh, aligned themselves with the W.D. Muhammad movement. Nah, that like a, that's like a revamp of they're Sunnis, Sunnis. They're Muslims, but they've left off that. But they still got nah, left off the the kufriyat, you no. know, of the nation. They ascribe to Sunni Islam, but also still, you know, in terms of certain masail of usul, you know, there is some still some khalil. Okay, you, you know, know nah. sometimes I find you using Arabic words. Sorry, yeah, there's still, yeah. There, are still <laughs> there are still some errors <laughs> yeah, as it relates to some of the heresy. No, no, nah, nah, no, the yeah, they, the, the, the WD Muhammad movement, they you know, they abandoned the 
heresies and the, the, the disbelief of the nation of Islam. The nation of Islam, they claim that every black man is God. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's from amongst their disbelief. And it has nothing to do with Islam. Nah, nothing to do with Islam in, in, in the slightest. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, nah, they're, um, they're, you know, Firqa Kafir Asliya. They're yeah. disbelievers from the very beginning. Abu Iyad because of the nation of Tawud. So, you know, you had a number of, a, a large group of people. You know, Malcolm X, for example, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he left the nation. Mm -hmm. So there was a large group of people in Philadelphia that left the nation and they you know, embraced Sunni Islam. What years was this kind of? Allah, Allah you know, you'd have to ask somebody, you <laughs> know, there, yeah, yeah, from yeah, there. Yeah. <laughs> Now, Sheikh Talha, you have to ask Sheikh Talha. Yeah, Sheikh Talha and others. Sheikh yeah, yeah, some of the <laughs> elders. Yeah. yeah, some of the other yeah. elders. That was before my time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, so, you know, you had the W.D. Muhammad movement. And, you know, like I said, Sunni Muslims, but again, they made some errors as it relates to certain matters of aqeedah, mm -hmm. you know, and certain matters of methodology. Sheikh Rashid Babi is writing a book, uh, you know, a piece of advice to them, I think, at this moment in time. Oh, He's written about oh, the Nation of Islam. You know, but this is a piece of advice to, to Muslims no. about some of, you know, the mistakes and errors with regards inside of that movement. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then a lot of people, alhamdulillah, you know, when the opportunity, I guess, the University of Medina, also some of them went to study in Egypt from the Dao again of the Imma, Sheikh Al-Albani, Sheikh Ibn Ubaz, Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen, Sheikh Mubi, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, Sheikh Rabi'a, Sheikh Fawzan and others. People started to benefit from their work. So they went to Medina, they went to Egypt, they went to Yemen. And then, alhamdulillah, those communities, mashallah, a lot of people started to embrace, you know, Salafiyya. Alhamdulillah. Naam, alhamdulillah. 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 Naam. Alhamdulillah. Subhanallah, it's amazing how, like, Sheikh Al-Albani, Sheikh Mu'bil, Sheikh Uthameen, Sheikh Uthameen, and Sheikh Mubaz, they're mentioned in these places that are just miles away from them. They have no intention, like, they're not, they're not even aware that they're being mentioned. No. But yet their da'wah reaches these areas. No. Subhanallah. And their da'wah is strong, and it has an effect upon the areas. That they, you know, that the people reside, alhamdulillah, and the people they see is visible, wallahu minna. You know, that they're part of the community and they're working for the betterment of the community based upon the principles of Islam. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In terms of other, like, was it was it mainly the kind of, um, that what's it called? The, the WD Muhammad WD movement. Muhammad movement. No. Was that the main kind of um, counteraction to, to, to the, the nation? Yes. No. In, in terms of when the Salafis are there, is that the main kind of, um, opposes to it is there any no not really to be honest with you alhamdulillah when you know a lot of them when you explain it to them in the right way alhamdulillah they listen and mm. they respect knowledge mm. you know from the general the common people the awam mm. obviously when you got the you know the heads and the callers to falsehood that's a different matter but the general people alhamdulillah they respect mm. you know people of knowledge or the people of the sunnah wal -lalham wal -minna. Mm. you know you have a you know a general level of respect but in america you have the habashis i think the main base for the ahbash is in philadelphia yeah yeah, no, no. yeah, yeah. philadelphia the ahbash are there yeah. Yeah, yeah, the habashi sect so how did they end up there like I don't know how they chose Philadelphia, to be honest with you. Wallahu a'lam. Alhamdulillah. Maybe because the even the Ahmadiyya, they've just built uh, a huge, what they claim to be a masjid. Yeah. You know, it's a ma'bad, min al ma'abid, yes. Mm. The Ahmadiyya, naam. The Ahmadis. They just yeah, built a huge place of worship in North Philadelphia. Because people see uh, the, uh, you know, the way that the, the people there are gravitating towards Islam. There's an iqbal ajib. There's a, you know amazing... You know, um, amount of attention from the non-Muslims yeah. as it relates to the religion of Islam. Wow. You know, and Alhamdulillah, the, the 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 productivity that they see in the Muslim communities, and how they see the Muslims are trying to better not only themselves, their families, and you know those who are around them. Mm. And you Allah. find that level of respect. To be honest, I think you know it's more so over there than here. I don't know, yeah. it, it, which is gharib, You know, I think on that level, yeah. Wallahu alam. I was watching the what's it called again the uh, Instagram page. How many people accepted Islam in uh, Ramadan? Amongst the close to 300 people Allah in Allah. our yeah. masjid alone, in Germantown. yeah, in Ramadan, 300 people now, like in a month, walking into the masjid, walking into the masjid, walking into the markah, some at the dawah table now, but majority of them coming to the masjid and saying, you know, I'm, I'm interested in Islam, or brothers having conversations with them, or you know, people having conversations with their family members, and like, you know, we want you to go to the markahs and for them to explain, alhamdulillah, the oh. basics of Islam. You know, so that you understand it and then you mm. can embrace it correctly. And the, the beauty of the markas, again, the literature of the people of the Sunnah, alhamdulillah, you know, there's free literature. Swami. So when anyone comes, we give them a free copy of the translation of the, the Quran, the meaning of the Quran, the noble Quran. And Swami. that's for free, alhamdulillah, by CC Da'wah. Yeah, you yeah. know, alhamdulillah, they sent to us with alham thousands mm. so that we can distribute them for free. Also, we have the leaflets from the brothers, 
in uh, Saudi publications, <laughs> alhamdulillah, in addition to you know, some of our leaflets that we give them for free. The book by Sheikh Abu Iyad, yeah. The Meaning of Islam. Yeah. Yeah. Islam we give yeah. them that for free. Amazing. So alhamdulillah, I think you know, we must, we're most probably one of the only centers that you know, give fr free literature. And, and the class you know, also Muslims. free. Yeah, and the classes. Uh, so then we have the class school. also on Saturday and Sunday. Sheikh Talai teaches the brothers and there's a sister, she teaches the sisters. So they teach them the basics um, and also they teach them about the prayer. And Sheikh Anwar has, I think it's one of the most... Um, very good beneficial book. books no, for the new muslim comprehensive a comprehensive guide, guide for the new muslim book, yeah. Actually, everyone mashallah we've seen that in so many different massage in the centers you you'll be amazed where mashallah. they you know yeah. where they teach it or they sell it <coughs> uh, mashallah what, what, would, what would you say sheikh hassan to um you know uh, in that regard because maybe you've dealt with this in the masjid and things like this a lot of people try and advise family members you know you know you got people like becoming muslim in ramadan you know, there's a lot of people in our community that would want their family members to also become Muslim. So how would they go about, you know, talking to their family members and who are not Muslim maybe and helping them and giving them that? I mean, obviously you have, you know, explaining to them, you know, through speech, you know, clarifying to them the beauty of the religion of Islam as it relates to the Tawheed of Allah Azawajal, the oneness of Allah Azawajal in his soul right to be worshipped. You know, the oneness of Allah and His Lordship, the oneness of Allah Azza in His names and His attributes, you know, and how that's in accordance to our fitrah, innate disposition that's established by, you know, sound logic. You know, the texts, all the divine texts, alhamdulillah, established that there is one God and only He deserves to be worshipped alone without any partners. You know, focusing upon those type of, you know, subjects to begin with, but also, you know, through the implementation, the correct implementation of the religion. You know, if you, for example, as a son or a daughter, if your parents see that, you know, you've become more dutiful in your conduct and your behavior or you're a more responsible father or you're, you know, a more responsible husband. Alhamdulillah, sometimes as they say, you know, your actions speak louder than your words. Yeah. You know, al -fa'al ablag min al -aqwal. Yeah. you know, so yes, through speech. And sometimes maybe you're not the be best person. So you might not, you know, have the ability to, you know, eloquently explain, you know, the basics of the religion. Take them to somebody who can, you know, Shamsi, Anwar. You know, and the other brothers, alhamdulillah, who, you know, Jamal and others that can explain, alhamdulillah, clearly, you know, the fundamentals of the religion. Because I think explain clearly, yeah. alhamdulillah, you know, it's powerful. It's very hard to, you know, to reject it. No doubt. Some people do out of arrogance or for whatever other reasons, you know, some out of fear and there are other reasons. Now, some because of love of the dunya. But alhamdulillah, you know, as the, one of the companions, he said, inna ala al -haqi la nura, you know, there's a light upon the truth. Subhanallah. You know, some of the companions, they heard one verse, you know, and subhanAllah, they, they accepted Al-Islam. Yeah. You know, my, they said, my heart almost flew out of my chest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that was one verse of the Quran. Yeah. 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 Obviously, going back to a uh, German town uh, and the Dawah there, 300 people embracing Islam in Ramadan. That's amazing. Now, yeah. another thing I've seen you guys do, uh, more so over the last year, is that you've used videos. You've used videos. Uh, obviously, Shamsi, the US Dawa, we use videos, it's known. But how have you seen, Allah knows best, the use of videos impact your community? I mean, let me explain <coughs> the issues of videos. Yeah, no a doubt. A lot of people are asking. A lot of people are asking. No, I understand. I mean, you know, Sheikh Mukbi, rahimullah, you know, our Sheikh was, I think, from the sternest of people against, you yeah. know, using videos. Yeah. And with regards to, you know, pictures and those type of subjects. Again, alhamdulillah, no doubt we respect the positions of all of the scholars. But I think that, again, whoever adheres to the position of Sheikh Mukbir, rahimahullah ta'ala, you know, we don't censor them or disparage them. We respect their position. But at the same time, you had other scholars, Sheikh Ibn Ubaz, rahimahullah, one time, you know, he likewise was against using, you know, videos for yeah. da'wah, but he said, Ammat bihil bilu, it's an issue that's affecting everyone. He said, and I don't see that it's something that should be left at this moment in time. Yeah. You know, and you see that change. Because some people, you know, you often you see, you know, well, what happened to, you know, I thought that we weren't using videos. Yeah. You have those are imma, imams of the religion, changing their position in matters of ijtihad such, a, ijtihad such as this. What do you think about others? Alhamdulillah. And that difference, Alhamdulillah, is a difference amongst the imma of the scholars of the sunnah. Yeah. If you utilize, but like I said, in the correct capacity, yeah. naam, and in the correct way, like lessons, Alhamdulillah, yeah. like the brothers with Alhamdulillah giving da'wah and so on and so forth. Yeah. 
I think that, you know, some people, they listen to audios. I think that with regards to the non-Salafi audience, a lot of videos have reached them where maybe, wallahu a'lam, you know, they may not have had access or known where to access our audios. And Allah knows best. Yeah. You know, I, I, you know, a lot of people come to us in America. We went to Minnesota, the place where, you know, we went near the place where George Floyd was, you know, was mm-hmm. killed. And as soon as we got out the, um, the car, the brother set up the dawa table there. And there was a brother, he was like, he was like, Hassan Somali. <laughs> he was like, subhanAllah, you know. <laughs> but he, he, he asked about Shamsi. Mm-hmm. But like I said, the dawah has even reached, you know, those areas. Yeah. So I think it's, you know, wallah, and Allah knows best. I think it's, you know, exposed, you know, the, the lectures and some of the, you know, the mahadharat or the lessons to a wider audience and Allah knows best. Now, the useful. people of the sunnah, alhamdulillah, not, they know where to access the audios and they yeah. can listen to the durus and they can benefit. Mm. But I think there's others that, for example, might not have heard certain messages or certain clarifications, yeah. you know, if, for example, they had to access, you know, those audios in themselves. Now, and Allah knows best. Wallahu Yeah, because that's what we're finding. We're finding people that are only engaged through the tube or certain social media apps. They don't know how to use audio. No. They don't know. They've never heard of it. It's that bad. They don't have that uh, capacity to sit down and listen. But you're finding people that are, you know, using these apps and finding the sunnah through little, little 30 second clips or minute clips or whatever it may be. They're finding, you know, themselves levitate towards truth. Yes. See, I I see the argument from both sides because somebody may counter. And again, alhamdulillah, again, these are conversations that... You know, uh, we brothers. Counter the counter. Yeah, yeah, brothers. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no. I'm saying. <laughs> the counter, the counter. <laughs> you know, some brothers mention Alhamdulillah, and again, like I said, it's fr- you know, it's a point of view, and it depends on your perspective. Yeah. And again, al ilm and Allah Azza wa Jal. Some people may argue that Alhamdulillah, you know, the tapes of Sheikh Al Albani, you know, there there were no videos, and they benefited the dunya. Allah knows best. Like I said, I mean, the thing about it, like uh, I think the most important thing is whatever a person is comfortable with. You know, alhamdulillah, biha wa ni'mat. Personally, I do see the benefit in it. But Sheikh Hassan, no. uh, 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 that is true, no doubt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. However, I never knew Sheikh Albani when I was back home. No. Wa Anyu Qardawi. No. Wa Anyu Qardawi, this is a deviated Sheikh, because he was on the TV. Yeah. So, awam al nas, like Sheikh Albani, I didn't know Sheikh Albani, Sheikh Ben Baz, but Anyu Qardawi, there was another guy. So, awam al nas, they know Qardawi more than Sheikh Albani, Sheikh Ben Baz. That's what was my point to have the no. love him. I said, look, we, we hope everyone to be Talib Ilm and Sheikh. No. But that's not the reality. But what we want, we want our Salafiyah to reach everyone. And one of the tools that can be utilized in a correct manner, like you mentioned, man, I bless you, is videos. That's the reality. But, but the thing about it, again, it goes back to the matter being a matter of ijtihad. No doubt. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. I said, you may perceive it that way. Somebody else comes with a counter argument. Yeah. Alhamdulillah, you see our scholars were well, lalham. There were those, you know, who agree with it, you know, and there, there yeah, were yeah. those who abstain from it. Alhamdulillah, you know, respect each other's positions. Yeah, really. That's right. I understand, you know, your point of view, alhamdulillah. Mm. The, I think the most important thing is that, you know, because somebody still may argue, you know, like Sheikh Mubi, rahimahullah, he did mention, Nam, that, you know, certain individuals, they became, um, you know, famous because of television or the radio yeah. stations. But he said that's why the people of the Sunnah, Alhamdulillah, the science of al Jarhu Ta'adil. So, no doubt, you know, I think that that's a, a point, but I think there's also some, a, a point that people may counter. I think amongst ourselves, the most important thing, if somebody's uncomfortable, Alhamdulillah, Jazakum Allah Khair. Yeah, no doubt. This if, is I think, and if somebody is comfortable, you know, Alhamdulillah, at the end of the day, I think that me personally, it was, I went to Saudi Arabia with the brother Muta in uh, Riyadh. Yeah. And he was like, um, he's like, subhanAllah, you agree with the videos? And I was like, I'm comfortable with it, you know, from a religious point of view. Yeah. After researching the matter, after yeah. reading it. And I think, that's, I think that's important as well. That, you know, sometimes, you know, even when we look at these subjects, we look at them firstly from a religious point of view. Mm-hmm. You know, tastadil thumma ta'taqid. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, don't ta'taqid thumma tastadil. La ahlu bidah. Yeah, like the people of innovation, yes. meaning that you look at the proofs and then your position is in accordance to the proofs. Alhamdulillah, you arrive at that, you know, it's allowed. Okay, tayyib, no problem. There are scholars that preceded you in that. Mm-hmm. You arrive, you look at the proofs and you arrive at the conclusion that you prefer to abstain from it. Alhamdulillah, you have scholars that preceded you in that. I think that's the most important thing. I think the danger comes, whichever position you take. If you take it just on, you know, I'm taking the rukhsa regardless. 
I think that's when it becomes a, yes, a dangerous yeah. route. I get no doubt. You. Wallahu alam. No, no doubt. Because yeah. one thing I remember, even Shimsi was saying this year just now, is that when YouTube kind of first, you know, hit the internet, the sheikhs that you were seeing, or I was seeing, to be honest, always on my days a bit more, you know, earlier than, or, you know, later on, was like the Yusuf Estes, the Zakir Nikes, and Ahmed Didas. All right, you know, they did their bit, but they're not people of Sunnah. No. That's the thing. And they were filling up the net with their videos alone. You couldn't find people of Sunnah, you know, on... Because obviously I'm from, the, you know, down, <laughs> the dumb down generation. We don't read as much. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's difficult. But the reality is the videos that have hit, you know, a lot of a lot of the people that come to our messages, for example, Shamsi, most of them were ex Ali Dawa or ex Muhammad Jab fanboys. Yeah. A lot of them have come to the masjid. It's because of the refutations, not literally just on them, but on the situation of the clarification of the Sunnah. Now, even Alhamdulillah, even the Kitab al-Tawheed Dars, uh, Subhanallah, even like traveling, you know, we're inundated with like you know messages. When are they going to continue? Yeah. And like like I said, you can see the reach, Fine. you know, without a shadow of a doubt. Mm. Even the side, yeah, the one the I want to go to Sheikh, even the, the conference that they lot did, the uh, Shah Abdul Hamid Nasser said his book. Oh, yeah, uh, means to happiness. Yes, yeah, and you yeah, can yeah, see the no, views. No doubt, I agree with you. Even, people. even we done um, in Ramadan, the yeah. 30 themes from 30 verses. Mm. And it shows you, yeah, yeah, in Ramadan, like every day in Ramadan, Alhamdulillah, we would pick a verse, you know, from the Quran and with a, you know, particular theme. And we, it was based upon the individual and also the community. Yeah. You know, uplifting the individual, but also, you know, building a community. Mm. And even, alhamdulillah, the brothers were telling me, uh, people from, you know, various places that you would never imagine. Mm. So, alhamdulillah, like I said, I, I see a benefit in it, you know, personally. Mm. You know, at the same time, but, you know, if other, uh, other people, alhamdulillah, I think there are so many brothers, you know, alhamdulillah, teaching. You know, you have the likes of some of the brothers in, in the U.S., the brothers here. I think, alhamdulillah, that, you know, you, there are options available. You know, well, Allah. Nam. 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 You know, you know, you research matters because that's like I said. Even you know, and I spoke about this. I think in Markaz al Sunnah before, there are issues of khilaf. You know, student of knowledge looks and he researches those matters. The most important thing, actually, is not. We have to be cautious sometimes. Again, is transitioning into the Western life. You know, th there's a trap door that open for people that who you know, would once claim to be orthodox and they ended up being, you know, these liberalists that yeah. they've become. Well, and shaitan, may Allah protect us from it. Yeah. You know, and it's a door that exists. No you know, and the hay, the one who is living, is not immune from being trialed and tested. May Allah, Azawajal, you know, grant us all firmness. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Barakallah. Yeah. No, I know, yeah, I, see yeah. I see I see I see I know. But, we but, believe in the PDF. I'll tell you, Hassan, wait, wait. Yeah, yeah. I'm going <laughs> to establish good points here. Okay. <laughs> Sheikh Abu Iyaz PDFs on Muhammad Hijab when yeah. we had a class start doing it on videos. There were selfies. Some of them, they stood of lunch. I've asked them, have you read the PDFs? Wallah, ya sheikh. Two, there were like over 25. Two people say, we've read, but not all of them. If the selfies themselves, the brothers, are not reading the PDFs, what do you think about Hawam? No, because remember, listen, Sheikh, I, I know, you want to refute yeah. this person, so he's coming to you with a bazooka, and you come in with, may Allah bless Abu Iyad, because yeah. I believe for me. So what I said, like you said, he's doing his part. No, no. So we utilize it. Take it on. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I just believe in breaking it down. No, matters that they need to establish their religion on a daily basis. Mm. I think that's the most important thing, you know, which is the Rabbani Yoon. They teach people, you know, as Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu said, the simple matters of knowledge before the complica complicated affairs. At the same time, now, when things arise, you know, issues that have to be addressed, I think the most important thing is to, if they're matters of nawazil, then the scholars speak first. What's nawazil for the people that don't know? You know, current events that affect, you know, the ummah, okay. generally. Naam. Okay. Or, you know, or a new event that affects, you know, the ummah in maybe a particular locality or the ummah as a whole. Mm. The scholars, you know, alhamdulillah, the ones who speak, ahlil, you know, ahlil ilm, the ones who speak first in those affairs. If the scholars are silent, then we have to, you know, there may be a reason why they're silent. Naam. If they may be unaware if it's something relating to your community like mm. for example we had something in, in america recently mm. there was uh, an individual and there's been an increase in the number of cases in philadelphia people wearing you know muslim attire like uh, wearing that, a yeah. niqab to try and escape you know the police so alhamdulillah we had to issue a clarification about the harms of this wow you know on the community whether they're a muslim or a non-muslim trying to camouflage themselves and that this shouldn't be tolerated because of the harms of these type of things but like I said, it depends upon what the issue is. 
Nah, alhamdulillah. I think the most important thing mm. is that, you know, like I said, educating the community mm. so that they can establish their religion correctly. Mm -hmm. At the same time, if it's a matter, you know, relating to the whole of the ummah, the scholars are the first to speak on those affairs, especially serious affairs, you know, as it relates to honor, as it relates to blood and stuff like that. Mm. And if it's an issue in that particular community, alhamdulillah, you know, people, as long as it's addressed with knowledge, mm. alhamdulillah, based upon principles of the religion, you know, one, one of the doubts that yeah. the people of misguidance try to use that uh, you Salafis or Al-Sunnah Jama'ah, mm. when there's social injustice, you don't speak about it. Yeah. You only speak about Tawheed. No. But in the reality, to deal with social injustice, we have to understand the Tawheed. No. So you, if you can elaborate I mean, the thing about this. it, you know, Alhamdulillah, I think that's, you know, untrue and unfair. You know, we have to, you know, be just. You know, as Allah Azza wa says in the Quran, in Allah ya'muru bil adli wal ihsan. Allah commands with justice, you know, and benevolence, good treatment. And Al-Adl, Alhamdulillah, the Muslim has to stand for justice. So one of the companions, he said that's the most comprehensive verse in the Quran. Because justice, as it relates to the rights of the creators, to worship Allah Azza wa Jalla alone without any partners, that's no, justice. No. Naam. That's the greatest form of justice. The greatest mm -hmm. form of oppression is what? A shirk. shirk. Naam. Of, yeah. It's the opposite of that. So that's the foundation of justice. Now, then you have, no doubt, social injustice. Alhamdulillah, the Muslims speak about social injustice. Mm. If you look at what happened to George Floyd, Alhamdulillah, many of the mashaykh of the Sunnah, they address this matter, alham, based upon the Quran, based upon the Sunnah. They address the topic of racism. They address these topics, Alhamdulillah, in a clear fashion. Walillah, alhamd. However, we have to be careful because you have some, as they refer to themselves as activists, Muslim activists. Yeah. They fight social injustice But you see them, for example, partaking in things which compromise adl as it relates to the religion of Allah. For example, oh, okay. Mm, okay. when we had that, um, I think there was a protest at the border and you had one of the American imams. He partook in what was called libation, which is a religious that? ritual, pouring the water on the floor. Okay, yeah, Naam. Okay. You can't fight social injustice falling into mukhalafat that with contradicts. Injustice. Yeah, with injustice, <laughs> because that's dhulm. Yeah. The greatest injustice is shirk. Yes, it's like trying to, you know, combat social injustice, but you're falling into shirk, for example. Well, yeah. billah. Like yeah. at the same event, you had a priest. They call him a priestess. Do they call yeah. them? Yeah. Wallahu yeah. alam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nah. <laughs> um, she was drawing the cross on the heads of some of the attendees, and some of them were Muslims. Are you serious? Yes, yeah. it's, 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 it's recorded yeah. on video. Yeah, it's it's, it's maaruf. Yeah. yeah. Well, I didn't even know that. It's on I video. Knew about the so, Omar Suleiman. I knew about a libation. He was there. He yeah. never had the cross drawn on his head, but he was uh, uh, in attendance. He, he, was, he was the one that partook in the libation. Mm. Naam. And again, subhanAllah, for brothers like him, you know, you know, our advice is, if we want to be you know, leaders of the Muslim community, we have to learn about the matters of Tawheed. That's mm. right. You know, I saw, again, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rectify all of our affairs. Amen. And again, we want good for him like we want good for anyone else. Mm. I saw him give, you know, inviting someone to Islam and giving the shahada to someone. He said, say, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. He said, Say that there is only one God and He is Allah, or something similar to that. How, subhanAllah, you do not know that the meaning of La ilaha illallah is La ma'bud bi haqqin illa Allah. None has the right to be worshipped in truth except Allah. And again, you have to learn about the fundamentals of the religion because, in order to fight against injustice, it's based upon Tawheed. It's based upon, which is the greatest form of justice. And then, Alhamdulillah, no doubt we speak about other forms of injustice. But we don't compromise as it relates to that fundamental, yeah. you know, to fight against something that is subsidiary compared to that. Mm. No. Just to go back to that point, because um, it's going to go over a lot of people's heads. It's just the state of the Muslims today that when we translate the Shahada, yes. um, obviously we, well, most people would think that that's a, a correct translation. They wouldn't understand the details of it. Yes. So why, why, what's wrong with that translation? Because if you go to the Christians and the Jews, they say we believe in one God. Mm. Mm. They, they say we believe in one God. The Christians, I think in the Arabic Bible, they refer to God as Allah. Allah, yeah. Allah that's Now, likewise, if you go to the grave worshippers, they, they will say what? We believe in one God. Mm. Now, so that statement is not the La ilaha illallah. That's not what the Prophet Sallallahu invited the polytheists of Quraysh to embrace. When he invited them to say La ilaha illallah and you will be successful. And when the Prophet Sallallahu invited them to say that, they said what? Has he, Muhammad, made all of the gods into one God, meaning yeah. to worship that one God, yeah. Naam, and forsake all of the idols? Because they used to believe, like, yeah, well, in Sa'al to man khalaqa samawati wal ard. If you were to ask the polytheists, yeah. who created the heavens and the earth, they would say Allah. They would say God, mm. Naam, created the heavens and the earth. So they believed in the lordship, God's lordship. 
but they associate partners with Allah as well as it, with God as it relates to worship. So the correct meaning of La ilaha illallah is that none has the right to be worshipped in truth except Allah Azza wa Jal. No. Any act of worship has to no. be directed to Allah. Any act of worship has to be directed to Allah, That's directed crazy. to God. If you believe that God, Nam, God is our Lord, He is our Creator, He is our Sustainer. The God that you believe, He is our Lord, He is our Sustainer, He is our Creator, who has perfect names, uh, He has beautiful names and perfect attributes. He is the one that we worship alone. Mm -hmm. So La ilaha illallah means none has the right to be worshipped in truth except Allah. So mm -hmm. just to elaborate, no. when we say any act of worship, doesn't mean that you, as a pagan, you believe something is an act of worship, you direct to Allah. Any act of worship has to be legislated from Allah no. or His Messenger. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So that's the worship. And, and that's very thing. important because mm -hmm. if, you, if you don't explain it to the people correctly, how are they going to implement it correctly? Because there's nothing in Islam that, that is not dependent on that. That's the, that's the foundation of everything. Even Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he said, that is the reason for the existence of the heavens and the earth. Allah. That's the reason for our, you know, our very existence, humans. Allah. To the extent that that is the reason why the paradise and hellfire exists. Mm. The muhidun, the people of Tawheed, they will be in paradise. Yes. Those who die worshipping Allah Azawajal alone without any partners. The hellfire is for the people of shirk, those who worship other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm. He said, naam, that the heavens and the earth will only continue to exist as long as there are those in the earth that say la ilaha illallah. Mm -hmm. When there's no tawheed on the earth, the earth will cease to exist. Allah will decree its end. That's how important that state statement is. La ilaha illallah. Mm -hmm. And that's why it has to be understood correctly and implemented correctly. Mm -hmm. You know, subhanAllah, Shaykh, also, I remember Shaykh Fawzan, may Allah preserve him. Mm -hmm. He was saying that you see some du'at going to uh, some villages and speaking to them about issues has nothing to do with the people. For example, speaking back then about the civil war in Algeria. He, the Sheikh said how someone in a Bedou, uh, in a Bedou is going to help what is happening in Algeria, civil war, or about liberalism. No. Because if people understand the correct Tawheed and the Sunnah, then they will stay away, stay away from liberalism or feminism. You understand, Sheikh? No. So Alhamdulillah, Ahlus Nur Jama'ah, when they teach Tawheed and the Sunnah, because they know by understanding Tawheed and the Sunnah that will, by Allah's permission they will be protected from any deviations. Allah Akbar. Even uh, Al Imam Sa'di in the, you know, the booklet that we went through tonight, we just summarized you know, parts of it. We didn't have time to cover all of it. That ad din Sahih, the correct religion, Islam, solves all of the problems, the world's dilemmas Allah and Akbar. problems. Mm -hmm. He started with Tawheed. He said that's the foundation. And then Allah he Akbar. goes on to discuss other problems and dilemmas as it relates to knowledge, mm -hmm. as it relates, like I said, to wealth and poverty, sickness and health. Um, domestic uh, politics and international politics but he said all of that stems from Tawheed that's Allah the foundation Akbar. of everything Allah Akbar. not saying Alhamdulillah we address other matters as well but that's the foundation he said if you don't have that firm foundation immorality and corruption will come with it SubhanAllah. and he gave the example he said look he said with regards to atheism yeah. for example which is not new you know you have some people they say like for example people in America, some of the, you know, the influencers and podcast hosts, yeah. they say, why are you worrying about whether Allah Azza is above the throne or whether Allah Azza is everywhere? Well, billah. We worry about it because Allah said in the Quran, I mean, to Manfis Sama, do you feel safe from the one who is above the heavens? Mm -hmm. The most merciful, he rose above the throne. They say, why do you worry about these things when our battle is with atheism and liberalism? Atheism existed. It never just appeared today. Yeah. The naturalists, Allah has just told us about them in the Quran. They said nothing destroys us except time. Yeah. Today they're just a, you know a more you know advanced you know version of them. But it's exactly in essence the same thing. They change the terminology. It, the terminology, the and they sound yeah. you know they're more eloquent and they sound you know more wise. Yeah. But the arguments are exactly the same. Mm. And he mentions that you know with that atheism and with that disbelief, that's where immorality comes from. Because now, for example. There's no divine laws that are, you know, that a person is restricted to as it relates to their daily lives. So then look like the Greeks and the Romans, you know, even though they believed that they were intelligent and they were advanced and they had the philosophers, look at the immorality and how the immorality, you know, it led to the decay of the society of theirs from within. May Allah protect us from that. And that's why he said, Nam, even worldly knowledge, it still has to be based upon what? It has to be based upon Tawheed and correct knowledge. Because that worldly knowledge can blind you and you become a uh, materialist, a madi. Yeah. And then you start looking down upon the knowledge that the messengers they came with. Allah okay, yeah. It's a deep risala. Like I said, if it hasn't been translated, it definitely should be translated. Yeah. Be. You know, there's a French author. Nah. He said, he said, the Western world should not be scared of Islam. They should be scared of themselves. How, especially with immorality no. spreading and pushing, no. they're going to destroy themselves by themselves. But even like, if you look at the, issues, the, issue, the issue of drugs. 
mm. you know, intoxicants. I was just about to ask you that. You one, know, the, yeah. like I said, the the rise of violence. Mm. You know, again, and one of the reasons the collapse of the family structure. These are, you know, areas <coughs> that Alhamdulillah, the religion addresses well, Alhamd in detail, even economics. Mm. You know, you know, we poverty in inner cities. Alhamdulillah, Islam addresses all of this. And again, these battles that you know are taking place in this time, more so liberalism, yeah. now neoliberalism. There were battles between Islam and communism and socialism. The scholars spoke about it in detail. It's just any time you have an advancement, and again, here, you know, it's more technological advancement, computers, social media, artificial yeah. intelligence. Any time, you know, a new type of knowledge appears, that discussion appears as well. Yes, now, sir. Yes, sir. Mm. it's not nothing new. You know, sir. there's going to be different types of falsehood until the hour is established. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Same now, ideas, but yeah. different tools. Yeah, expressed in different ways. <laughs> it's expressed now, in that, If you look at it, when the, the Quran was being revealed, um, alcohol was present. People were taking alcohol, people were doing zina. But when the, the verses in the Quran that would talk about Jahannam, belief in Allah, belief in the Akhirah, these things that soften the people and they that, that allow them to leave off those things. No. So the Quran's got the solution, the solution is there and it's pr proven in history to work. Yeah. So going back to the origin, isn't it? Quran's Even one yeah. of the things, you know, I advise myself and the brothers, you know, and this is from the advice of Shaykh ibn Uthaymeen, rahimahullah ta'ala. Shaykh ibn Uthaymeen, and I mentioned it when I was discussing the 30 themes in, from 30 verses. Mm. He said, it's not enough for us just to be a copy of a book. What did he mean by that? Mm. Meaning that, you know, we memorize books, yeah. like you memorize Zad, like in fiqh, you know, humbly jurisprudence. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, your attitude is that the only people that are going to benefit from me are people that come to me. We should be out mixing with the community. Right. Mixing with the people, yeah. said, you know, you know, sitting yeah. with the people. If you look at the scholars, yeah. uh, the scholars they would advise. Mm -hmm. One of the, again, you asked about one of the lessons from Sheikh Mubarak Taala, mm -hmm. which, you know, the greatest lessons that we took from him. Uh, he used to mix with the students, Allah. and he would encourage with mixing for benefit. Obviously, and the, when there's no benefit, he wouldn't mix. Mm -hmm. yeah. But he said no, uh, and you, you could walk with him. You know, you could go in his house and eat with him. Mm -hmm. Alhamdulillah. You know, he was present among the students. Which was the example of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and Alhamdulillah, that's why you notice sometimes you may have tulab al-ilm, Alhamdulillah, who Allah Azza wa Jalla grants them tawfiq. They may not have as much knowledge as maybe others, but Alhamdulillah, in terms of their efforts on the ground, educating the people, mixing with the people, being in the community, mm. but you see fruits from their da'wah that you don't see maybe fruits from other people, even though that other person has maybe more knowledge, but in terms of their jihad, their struggle in conveying it is not as great. So it's important mm. that we get out there, like he said, the Quran. You know, the people of the Qur'an, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, they are Ahlul Qur'an. He said, Ahlullah wa khasatu. They are the selective servants of Allah and those closest to him. Mm. They are the ones who are going to change society. You know, those who learn the Qur'an, but they implement it amongst the people. Mm. Wow. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, people will come and they will look at him, how he conducted himself, mm. how he dealt with the poor, how he dealt with the needy, how he dealt with the orphan. Just seeing the way that he behaved, people would embrace Islam just from his conduct, wow. from him mixing with the people. And I think that's something that's important, you know, for us, especially with the awam, with the mm. common people. Mm. People skills. Go easy nah. with them yeah. and be yeah, yeah. soft. And, and them yeah. feeling that it's easier for them to take advice if they feel that you care. Yes. You know, that it, it's yeah. coming from love. Yeah. Like I gave the example earlier. I said, you know, your parents. Sometimes your parents may scold you, yeah. but you know it's from a place of love. And in, you know, in hindsight, alhamdulillah, you can see that many times they were right. Yeah, it's true. It's, you know, the same thing with somebody that you, you feel genuinely loves you. Yeah. They may scold you. They may advise you, you know, sternly, mm. but you know that it's from a place of love. It's not malicious yeah. and you appreciate it. And that's why some of the Salaf, they used to say, you have an advisement to you said, you know, to my face what, you know, what I dislike. But again, from the aspect of love and you feel it's genuine love, not really just to belittle me or degrade me. Really yeah. wanting good you know, for Yeah, wanting good for a person. Yeah. You know yeah. what Sheikh Saadi mentions, subhanAllah, Sheikh Abdul Rahman bin Nasir Saadi, may Allah mercy when he said, when Allah threatens his servant with Jahannam, that is out of mercy. Allah Akbar. Yeah. To show them that don't fall into disbelief or disobedience because it will lead you to this place. SubhanAllah. Allah. He said that's what Allah mentioned in details. It's out of mercy. No. I love that he doesn't want his servant to be in this place. No. Uh, you know, Sheikh Hassan, we've got a lot of um, some people, you know, you're talking about the problems in society and stuff. There's a lot of um, psychological problems, emotional problems, depression, anxiety, things like that. No. Uh, Sheikh Abdurrahman Nasr al Saadi, the book that the, the beneficial means to a happy life. Yeah, the yeah. first point was in in living a happy life and finding a happy life, you know, 
uh, is to believe in Allah. That was the first point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like it's yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So as well yeah. as the drug problem and as well as the, uh, you know, all the other vices, you've got the issue of happiness and sadness and things yeah. like that sorted. No. By believing in Allah and establishing some ulama, you know, said that you never understand yourself until you understand you create and worship Allah. Yeah. Because they say the heart was created, of course, Allah created the heart to work. And Ibn al Qayyim says this Imam Ibn al Qayyim says that the, 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 the heart was created to worship Allah alone. And once it doesn't do that, it's like it's, it's, it's not in its place, it's out of its comfort zone. No. So you fall into depression and you fall into anxiety and things like this. It's like a fish out of water. You take a fish out of water, it, it doesn't survive. So the heart needs that connection with Allah. It's like uh, Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, he said in Al-Nuniya, فَحَرَبُوا مِنَ الرِّقِ الَّذِي خُلِقُوا لَهُ no. You know, they run away from the servitude that they were created for, meaning to worship Allah alone. And they were, you know, punished and they were trialed with servitude to their soul and to the devil. Mm. And you see, you know, you can't satisfy your soul. Yeah. And you just see misery come from that. You know, you claim, and that's the, you know, the prevalent statement, you know, I'm free. Without religion, I'm free. No, you're not free. You're a slave to your soul. Yeah. And you see the misery and the depression, you know, and the, the, how these people, they gravitate towards, you know, drug abuse yeah. or alcohol, you know, abuse. Why? Because, you know, the life is void, like you said. The, the heart is not fulfilling the purpose that it was created for. Yeah. Nor the mm. tongue, nor the limbs of the body. And, you know, the, our very existence is still here. No. Yeah. 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 Last question, inshallah. <laughs> <laughs> inshallah. Yeah. It's an important one because I know we're affected by it and definitely you guys are affected by it. No. How can parents communicate with their children effectively about important issues like drugs, gangs, and haram relationships? I think with parents, it's important that we start educating our children from a young age. I think one of you brothers put up the benefit from uh, Sheikh Taqiyaddin al-Hilali, rahimahullah. Yeah. I think it was Dar al-Sunnah, I don't yeah. know who translated yeah. it. Yeah. And he mentioned yeah. that, you know, adherence to other religions in America they send their children to regular school in the morning, and I think in the evening they w it would be religious school. And he said, sadly, and he was talking about, you know, because he was an Arab, he said, some of our Arab brothers, you know, they just focus upon the secular side of things, and they ignore the religious side of things, which opens up doors for disaster. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important that, you know, parents, alhamdulillah, that we start off you know, sh you know, showing the respect and the importance of knowledge, Islamic knowledge, the importance of learning Quran, the importance of learning about the correct belief. And Alhamdulillah, also seeing that our children see from us that we love it. Because if we're telling our children that learning the Quran is important, but they never see us reciting the Quran. Or studying knowledge, Islamic knowledge is important, but they never see us studying knowledge. Mm. You know, it becomes a bit farcical. Yeah. Naam. So I think it's important that Alhamdulillah that the children naam, that see from the parents that they're diligent or they have a love for knowledge and a respect for it, but also that the parents themselves, Alhamdulillah, they instill in their children a love for knowledge. Because again, one of the Salaf, he said, he said that this nation, La tazalu hadil umma bi khair ma ta'allama wildanum al Quran. This nation will not cease to be in a state of good as long as the children learn the Quran. Deep. And if you look at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that's Ibn Abbas. He made dua to Allah. Oh Allah, give him understanding of the Quran. He became the expert in interpreting the Quran, you know, a mountain of knowledge mm. that people used to refer to even at a young age. And Alhamdulillah, it sort of insulated him from any, you know, foreign influences because he had, Alhamdulillah, he was nurtured upon Quran and Sunnah. And I think that's important that we, prevention is easier than cure. That's right. You know, uh, everyone was talking about, you know, injections. <laughs> now, <laughs> and you know, the most important, you know, injection, the most important prevention is what? Educating mm. our children, Nam as it relates to the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam, I think that's one of the most important things. That will help Nam instilling them confidence as it relates to their Islamic identity. They have an understanding of the religion. Then they want to imitate others in that which is detrimental. Now we see, subhanAllah, how many, I don't know about here, but in America, how many, of, I think I've, I've seen in Cardiff, how many young children have dreadlocks. Yeah. Ach, it's amazing, subhanAllah, in the masajid. Yeah, yeah. I've never seen it like this. Mm. And where's that from? Ach, it's from the draw culture. Mm. Yeah. But again, if you understood the, the, you know, the negative consequences of that, you wouldn't gravitate so strong towards it. Because why? That music right there, Ibn al-Qayyim said, music generally is the Quran of the shaitan. 
in that real culture, and it's affecting us, you know, in inner cities, I think more so than other places, yeah. it's glorifying murder, it's glorifying drug use, it's glorifying zina. Okay, it's glorifying every anything you can think that's satanic. Again, how do we protect our children from that? Prevention, alhamdulillah. Rather than, you know, watching them, indulging those things, and then we want to address it. We have to preempt them to the best of our ability. And that's why Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he said something important. He said, if you were to look at the majority of the corruption of the children, you would find it's in the negligence of the parents in educating them about Islam correctly. The majority. A person, now, it may be, a person educates their children correctly or opens for them the opportunities to be educated mm. and Allah tests them. May Allah protect us all from that. Amen. Like Nuh alayhi salatu was salam. Yeah. But he said the majority of the times when you, he said the corruption of the children, he said it's because the parents, they failed to educate them correctly about the religion of Islam. He said, and these children, they will not benefit themselves. And he said, likewise, when they become older, they will not benefit their parents. And that's what we're seeing. Mm. You know, bless the you know the da'wah. You know, Alhamdulillah, one of the things we see again, like I said, some of these things I think when you're part of it or involved in it, you don't sometimes see the significance of it. It's like I'll give an example. When you when you were in Damaj and you're there with Sheikh Mukbil, you understand Alhamdulillah, you're studying with the scholar of the Sunnah, an Imam of the you know of that era. But you didn't appreciate what you had at that moment in time yeah. because you would treasure every second of it. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's, you know, looking back. But even, alhamdulillah, just you see the efforts of the da'wah, alhamdulillah. Look, mashallah, the durus that we have in, you know, the various cities. Mashallah, tabarakallah, the efforts, you know, the da'wah tables, inviting the non-Muslims, people embracing al-Islam. You know, alhamdulillah, akhi, look, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if Allah, yahdi Allah bika rajulan wahida, if Allah guides through you one person, it's better than the red camel. Okay, it's, it's a blessing to be involved in that. Allah doesn't need us. We need Allah as well. You know, may Allah increase our efforts. Um, you know, know, because, you know, we can't just, you know, fall back and become lazy. Yeah. All of us have responsibilities. You yeah. know, you hear brothers saying, I have a family, I have children. Yeah. The Prophet Sallallahu he never had a family. He never had children. Yeah. You know, the Sahaba, they didn't have families. They didn't have children. Mm -hmm. We've got to keep moving. With we have to keep sacrificing. And like mm -hmm. you said, you made a good point. The people of falsehood are active. Yeah. Okay, we have to be more active. Yeah. You know? They're striving, our striving should be more. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us tawfiq Allah and forgive you. us for our shortcomings. Yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this kalima or this meeting and the fawaid have you on our good skills. Barakallah fiyum, ameen. Jazakum la khairan. So you can finish. We're smiley, sleeping. I was going to get to that part, Shamsi. Oh, that's what I told us. No, we asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like Shamsi said, to bless this sitting, this jilisa. And also, inshallah, maybe in the future have Hassan Somali come back. Uh, and I'm sure we'd all appreciate that. So, barakallahu. Shall you have to visit us as well, inshallah. Inshallah. Ahlan wa sahlan, marhaban. <laughs> Can't be one-sided, ah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tazawar, you know. Inshallah. Visits from both sides. Inshallah. Ahlan wa sahlan, marhaban. Barakallahu. Yeah. Inshallah. Wa sallallahu sallam ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.